Okay. Okay. I think I have it. Test, test, test. We're live. Looks familiar, huh? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are on time for Church of Christ, which is um, five minutes late. So um, let's go ahead and get started with a, with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, launch into our, uh, our class. A, <laughs> well, maybe a little fellowship would be good first. <laughs> For those of you that are uh, online, it's just great to be here in person, and uh, the fellowship is rich. So uh, we encourage you to partake when you feel ready for it. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful to be in your presence. Father, we feel the love for each other being together. We also feel the love for our brothers and sisters who are online this morning. And God, we just ask your blessings on all of us. Particularly, Father, we pray that as we look into your word, and we look at your character and your nature that we will be drawn more closely to you and understand your motivations for loving us so richly and so deeply. God, we are in awe of who you are and what you've done. And we thank you most of all for loving us so much to send Jesus, the, the very best of heaven, to redeem us. And Heavenly Father, in that spirit, we start our class this morning. We just ask for you to be present and in fill our hearts with your spirit and guide us and help us to love one another and the world as you do so that uh, others may share in that great hope of a life with you forever. Thank you for today. Thank you for a beautiful day. And we ask your blessings on all of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, well welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's good to see you all. And as it says, it's, you're at the adult class. The date's right for a change. Sometimes I miss those. Uh, it's not automatic, but again, we're in the series uh, about praying the names of God, and uh, I'll show you a picture of the book. I kind of repeat a little bit to get the intro together, but the whole idea is to try to come to understanding the nature of God a little bit more. Sometimes God seems distant and kind of hard to, you know, to grasp who he is because he's so multidimensional and, and in everything, created everything, and is... Uh, uh, all around us, and yet at the same time, it's, you know, you can think about the pictures you've seen, you know, from the Sistine Chapel, what, what is God like? Well, the, the Word reveals a lot about who God is, and that's what we want to do in this class, is to explore that and come to know Almighty God um, better than we know Him now. Okay, I am not able to change uh, the slides. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, it, the button was off, and so now I have to repeat the first three slides. Well, not really. Let me just click through them. Thank you, Thomas. Um, okay. All right. It's thinking. It's All right. Here we are. So um, last week, and I want to comment about last week a little bit, I thought Thomas Wood did a nice job of, of teaching the class, and he looked at two, um, uh, two names for God, Yahweh Nisi and Esh Okla and Elkanah. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Elkanah. It ended with a discussion about God as a consuming fire, and you can think about uh, what that means, but we had an ending discussion about the refinement that comes, uh, you know, and Thomas is really into metallurgy and uh, the whole idea of well, how do you make a pure metal out of an amalgamation? Do you ever think about recycling when they put all that aluminum and steel into, a, you know, they probably try to separate as much as they can, but, you know, once you put it in the big cauldron and you put the heat and the oxygen to it, what are you left with? How do you separate iron from aluminum, you know? Uh, you know, and there's electrolysis ways to do it, you know, sacrificial anode cathode. Are you going to tell me how to do this? No. Steel is just like doing crude oil. Uh, you put a certain amount of heat and iron will go in one direction, like float or sink to the bottom, yeah. and burgers will go to the top. And you drain that off, and then you put the next heat level on it, and the next metal you want will come out. And yeah. 
because they all have different heat levels of melting. Yeah, yeah different melting points. And, uh, but you've got to be very active. Yeah. Well, when you think about certain formula for like stainless steel. It has a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's exact formula. And I had a student who worked from, he used to work in a, a, a steel mill like you, but he was the quality control guy. So they would pull a hot, take dip a little bit out of the big cauldron and, and he would immediately test it. Does it have enough, you know, whatever, you know, iron and chromium and nickel, you know, and it had to be in three different proportions to get stainless 316 or whatever. Well, Let me bring it back to the Bible. As a scientist, I, as, I was a Boy Scout. We went to a steel mill, and that was one of the coolest things I ever saw. But anyway, uh, lots of sparks and heat and men in silver suits. But what I want to bring it down to is how does God refining us, right? You know, you think about the things in our lives that put there that, you know, I've heard this said before, but if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. And I don't think God's about killing us, but I think he's about making us stronger. And so I just wanted to add that on. You know, we, Nancy and I were uh, doing class remotely last weekend. We were with uh, our daughter, her husband, and, uh, you know, I wanted to shout out and say, oh, you know, this, I can see the application to a, a refiner's fire in my life. You know, you're kind of on the forge of being changed into the, the precious metal that God wants you to be. So anyway, as I, I look at it, you know, God's names here, they're not static, they're dynamic, and it's all a part of, of growing us as God's people. All right, let's talk about today. We're going to look at two different names for God today, um, and I have to, I put down the pronunciation so I get it right. You know, I don't want my uh, experts in Hebrew giving me grief, <laughs> uh, or anybody else, I guess. So it's Kiddush Yisrael. And uh, Holy One of Israel, that makes sense, right? And then Yahweh Shalom, we've all heard of Shalom, right? So uh, uh, the Lord is peace. And I think that both of these are, are, are attributes of God that really could have meaning and bearing on, on who we are and how we live. Great. So I've kind of went gone through this about the whole purpose of the class. And um, uh, I'd like to end with the last sort of bolded underlying statement. The whole idea about uh, loving God is and, and getting to know him so we can love him more deeply and appreciate what he's done and what he's doing today. Um, and it makes it just more, it makes it easier in my mind to, to love him if you know him. It almost sounds like a song, right? Okay, let's talk about uh, Kedosh Yisrael, Holy One of Israel. Please grab up your Bible and turn to Leviticus 19, and we'll, we'll sit in Leviticus 19 for a bit. But uh, the key verse in this, uh, um, this morning's... I got to, let me get to it myself here. <clears throat> Is uh, Leviticus 19, uh, 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. The Holy One of Israel implies a very special relationship between God and the people of Israel and a call to be holy as He is holy. The people of Israel were set apart to be God's people and to be holy. And I believe as Christians, the same is true of us. Through Christ, we are, we are set apart. We're, we're to be different than the world around us. And we, too, are called to be holy. And yet, holy is one of those words that's, uh, you know, it's a very common term that's in the Bible. It's in there a lot, in fact. Um, okay. Maybe I have an extra slide in here. No, I don't. Oh, this is bad. I had a... You know how you change your slides and they leave the, uh, the animations on? Yeah, I, didn't, I forgot that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, Kadosh, it's a very common term. I mentioned it's in the, used in 
throughout the Bible, mainly in the Old Testament. There's a different word that's used in the New Testament. And it's a, it's a term that emphasizes God's otherness, separateness, and mystery. And I had to look up what otherness means, and that word came from the text. It's the quality of being different or unique. You know, each of us has an otherness. We're different. We're unique. We have unique fingerprints. We have unique DNA, those kinds of things. And the holiness of God is grounded in his nature. That's who he is. So let me just ask the question, and maybe I can go back and take the answer off. Let's see. Oh, my goodness, I get the whole slide. Oh, falling apart. Oh, you did take off the animations. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> he's, he's stupid efficient. All right. When you think of the word holy, what do you think of, what does that mean to you? Something's holy. Alan? I thought to believe it was uh, set apart. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, uh, it, it's special. It's over here. Okay. Yeah. okay. So Alan says, uh, holy means set apart, special. You know, somebody else, holy. Eric? That's, I think that's, that's exactly right. To add to it, um, there's a couple times in the Old Testament, one of them is Ezekiel 44, 23, where the priests are told that they have to teach the people to distinguish between the holy and the common. Yes. So this may be a stretch, but think about having dinner guests and think about bringing it out uh, the paper plates, yeah. you know, for everyday use, and then you have special guests, so you bring out the fine china. The fine paper That's plates. probably a bit of a stretch, but the idea that God is set apart, He's uncommon, He's <coughs> unique, yeah. um, yet approachable. Uh, but the, the idea of distinguishing between the holy and the common, yeah. the everyday and the you know, not so. Yeah, but you know, it, it, and I really appreciate and I hope uh, everybody online can hear that, that Eric was comparing just that specialness, that uniqueness, that you have your common dishes that you use every day, and then when you have guests over, you bring out the grandma, grandmother's china, you know, and you're saying, this is special, these are set apart. And that's, you think about God and his, and his nature, he's, he's, he's different, he's got otherness, he's, he's not like us. And uh, that's one of the things that makes him special and unique. Well, one of the things also to, to think about is, um, you know, where God is almost instantly makes things holy, right? I, I think about the, um, when Moses is out being the, doing the shepherd thing and, um, and the, the burning bush, and God says, Oof, take off your, your shoes because you're standing on holy ground, you know? So it, it made that whole area holy because of his presence um, and you think about the, the temple, the holy of holies where the, uh, you know, part of God dwelt which really set that apart and made that special so you start seeing this um, um, this uniqueness and this separateness and um, then, it, then it kind of rolls over then this whole question of how do we be holy how do we, what makes how can we be holy? We live in an imperfect world. We're imperfect people. Yeah. Josh? Uh, I don't know exactly. I've encountered this a couple of times talking with Chinese students, but there's some Chinese philosopher that talks about the difference between the snow on the mountain and the water in the sea. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the snow on the mountain is very pure and and set apart really, and then once the water flows down uh, to the sea, it, it's made its way across the whole earth. And they kind of use that as an example of uh, like you start out kind of innocent, and then in the end you're like the sea. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Most of the Chinese guys I talk to, they say they want to be like the sea. But I'm like, which one of the, what water do you want to drink? Yeah, you want to drink the water, the pure water on the mountain, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that's what as yeah. Christians we want to be like the, the snow on the mountain. Yeah. You know, that's kind of relating holiness to purity, and I think there's a connection there. It's maybe not exactly yeah. the same thing, yeah. but I think a holy person is also pure. Right. Well, then you think about... Uh, I love this. It's all about science, right? So you think about what happens when you have distilled pure water, you know, as my father-in-law calls it, H20, 
And, um, you know, and then as it interacts with oxygen, CO2, rocks, minerals, and those things start to weather. Of course, you form soil, amazingly. And then, uh, then the water gets carried out to sea. And what, what, is this, what is the ocean water, if you've ever tasted it, what is it? Salty. Where does that come from? It comes from the weathering of the landscape. Okay, so if we view ourselves as the water that's got the impurities in it, and um, I think your analogy is quite good when we ask, how do, how do we look into that continuum? Um, it's, it's us uh, in one form transformed into the pure form, and I think it, you, what you put in the equation there is Christ Jesus and the Lord and His Holy Spirit make that transformation. I, th I think that's a good analogy. I want to make a reference a minute ago. We were talking about... Um, what makes something holy? And I was talking to Eric Brott yesterday, and he and his family went on a, a, a national park vacation. And, uh, you know, Eric's a tough guy, doesn't cry a lot. And, um, and he was saying that he was in some places, you know, you think about it, Bryce Canyon or, um, you know, Zion National Park or the Grand Canyon, what have you. You're just in awe. You just, you, you, there aren't words for it. It's like a, he said, I don't like to say this, but it's kind of a spiritual, you know, kind of experience. Well, you know, we're, you're viewing the, the hand of Almighty God has done something that it reverberates in us. And I think that's, that's a lot of the, you know, the, say the feeling or the emotion that can come with being in the presence of something that's pretty holy. Okay? All right. I should move, move on. Okay, let's, let's read a little bit further in this uh, text of, and I'm going to e extract a little bit and just read uh, Leviticus 19, 1 through 4, and then 9 through 18. It gives a little more picture to uh, what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect your mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make mental gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. When you reap the harvest of your hands, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. <clears throat> do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired uh, worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. But fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You know, and we've, we've read that a, a, a zillion times probably, and a zillion means a large number. Uh, and, you know, and, and I can, you know, be, remember being a kid and having my parents make sure I was aware of this. And I remember the, the I think it was the very first time I lied to my parents. And because I was, it was a Sunday night, I hadn't done my homework, and Disney was on. You can watch Disney if you got your homework done. It's all done. You know, we watched Disney, and it was great. And then I went to bed, and then the guilt started eating me up. <laughs> I hadn't finished my homework. And, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, I, everybody was in bed. I got up, and, oh, I, I lied to you, and, you know, and all right, you're going to get up at dark 30 and finish it, and I did. But, uh, you know, I was reminded that day, do not lie, and, have, you know, honor your mother and father, and, and, but anyway, the point is, we're familiar with these commands. We're familiar with these descriptions. And, um, and I, I think the, what's interesting to me is that God lays those out there, and I believe that these are links to his name, to his character, to the way he is. And he is 
telling us to emulate him, I think is, uh, is, is one approach to it. But one of the things that, that I saw in the scripture um, is he just kept repeating, I am the Lord your God. Why do you think he does that? Forget. Uh, I'll, I'll enhance what Captain just said. He's, he does it because we forget. And, you know, this is a short reading, and it seems like we forget pretty fast. <laughs> and, the, and the point, in fact, the matter is it's true. Bill? Well, he, he says, you know, in the beginning, he sets the whole thing up. God does. It says, be holy. Like yeah. Yeah. I am holy. And all of these things in this list are doable. Yes. I mean, humans can be that way. Yes. And so if we, if we make up our minds that we're going to be that way, then we're on our way toward being holy as he is holy. Yeah. Because that's how he is. Yeah. And, and that, you know, he didn't literally say, and if you do all of these, this will this will make you like the person I want you to be, but I think it's implicit, and that's exactly what, what Bill was saying. Josh? I think, too, it keep, grounding it in the holiness of God, it keeps you away from legalism, you know. There's a way that we could follow all of these rules, or most of these rules, and still be, be evil people, right? Yeah. Uh, like, for example, in verse... Uh, in verse 19, keep my decrees. Do not mat different kinds of make different kinds of animals. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. But if I just read that verse, I'm like, hey, I'm good. I'm not a farmer, you know. <laughs> but it's about the holiness of God. And the Ten Commandments are the same way. The, the first commandment is, I'm the Lord your God, who who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Yeah. You shall have no idols before me. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's you know that's the it's. The relationship with God and trying to be like God, that's what is informing the way we live. It's not, uh, not just a list of rules. You can, a list of rules isn't going to save us. Yeah. Frank, you were going to say something? Well, I, I just, it's kind of a question I just wonder. I get the sense it's almost like when a parent tells a child and they say, because I said so. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and the reason a parent would say that to a young child, an older child, is because it, it was implied that the parent knows so much more yeah. than the young child. Mm -hmm. And if you ask why, you don't really possess all of the capability yet to understand. Yeah. Learn when I say do it because it's in your best interest. Yeah. I, I don't know if that has a part of this or not. Kind of. I, mean, I, I think it does. And if you didn't hear that, Frank said that you know, as a as a child. Uh, when you have children, you're a parent, and you tell your child, don't cross the street without you know, looking and making sure it's clear first. Why? <laughs> because uh, it'll lead to your longevity, <laughs> you know, and you can give them all the reasons. He thinks sometimes that if we look at this, this verse out of Leviticus 19, it's kind of do this because God said so, you know, and you, and you hold them with that kind of respect. You treat them as holy, as something sacred. His words are pure, are true. Alan? Just expanding on that line, uh, I, I knew a fellow whose uh, little girl was having a birthday party, and they had the candle the cake, and they lit the candles, and she was reaching for a candle. I said, she's going to touch that. She'll let go. <laughs> um, God doesn't do the, she'll, she'll let go thing. God mm -hmm. says, don't do that. It's hot. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to burn you. Yeah. And you don't know what it is until you try it, but still, yeah. he, he's on the, on the prevention side. Yeah, well, that's, that's an interesting way to look at it. You know, God, because, you know, there is consequences to sin. You know, he didn't, I mean, he did tell Adam and Eve, there are consequences if you disobey me. You know, and they're like, it's like a lot of kids. You know, that stove is hot. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> you know, and, you know, my father would say, you don't have to, you know, repeat everything to, you, you know, you can learn from other people, you know, and so he was advising that. Greg? Well, what Frank said, 20, 22, 23 year olds do the same thing. They ask why. Oh, yeah. Man. My answer was always because I'm responsible for this if you are not. Yeah. And I'm the one to get yelled at, and then you're the one to suffer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I can even bring it down to a, a work situation where I had a very bright person who's working for me, and um, made all the assumptions that they were in charge. 
hold the phone. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm the research director here, and you know, you you'll have some freedom. But you know, since I have to write the checks and you know make this happen, um, I'm going to have a lot of input to this, and you you need to learn how to follow this lead. And that was, and maybe the first time in her life, uh, maybe her parents never told her no or anything, but. Uh, I, it, it was it was a tough conversation to have with a 27 year old, but uh, it, it's worked out really well. Okay, let's. Uh, if you were, if this passage we read a few minutes ago was the only scripture you had read, what would it tell you about the character of God? What 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 would you take? What would be a takeaway? God is X Y Z, or this is what I learned about Kathy. He told them when, when they harvested their foods yeah. not to take everything, yeah. to yeah. leave some for the poor and the widows. Yeah. I'm really glad you said that. You know, the, the idea that w the verse that she, Kathy referred to is the one where he's saying, you know, leave something for other people. Um, and in and, and doing that, that, you come to the conclusion God is going to take care of me. And that's that faith, that's that trust. And how often do we, we rely on our own devices first? And uh, then we come to God versus, you know, Nancy's, what are you always telling me? Thankfulness and trust. Be thankful for what God has done and trust him in the future. And, um, you know, and that's implicit. So Kathy says, if you were to look at that scripture, God is generous. He's not only generous to us, he's generous to others. Anything, anybody else looking at that scripture? Excuse me? God is just. He's just. Yeah, there's, you know, he hasn't gone uh, you know, big on the consequences, but uh, he's telling us how, how to be successful. Casey, in a second, I'll, uh, I'll give Nancy first. Well, in all these things, he's trying to protect us. These things are in our own best interest. He knows a lot more than what we know, and um, because he's God. And, and um, I just feel, I just, I read protectiveness, you know, because if you do these things, there will be consequences. And so, you know, he's like, it's a preventative thing. It's yeah. just, he loves us so much, he wants, it's like you want to protect your child from doing something that's going to harm them. And yeah. so you warn them, and this is what yeah. it is. Yeah, so it's like he's being proactive to protect us. He's got our interests at heart. Casey? This is really a fleshing out of the second the greatest command, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. It's really going through much more detail and specifics and, and helpful for us to do. Right, right. Yeah, so um, the idea is how, how, to, how to be successful in our lives with others. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the challenge that comes from this, then, is this idea of uh, if we were to prayerfully look at that, that set of verses, what speaks to us? Where do we need to make some adjustments? Where do we need to listen to God to become more holy? I need to, um, you know, I don't know what that would be. Um, I'm a person that's very thorough. Maybe I should leave more stuff laying around, right, Nancy? I don't think that's what it's saying. <laughs> but uh, the idea that, uh, you know, there's some behaviors that are being, God is generous to us, let's be generous to others, okay? But think about that. Um, what do we need to, to change to live uh, according to God's uh, guidelines for holiness, all right? All right, let's, let's do the, um, the prayer part now. Uh, let me get to that slide. And what I'd like you to do is to, we'll, we'll pray for two minutes. A minute and 30 seconds. That seems we can say a lot of words in two minutes uh, in our minds. So the, uh, reflecting on um, Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. And let me, let me go to that because it's a different reading. All right? And I'll read that to you. But listen to this, and uh, then we'll pray about this. Uh, Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. In the year of the king... Uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. 
Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the, uh, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this uh, has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. You know, so this is this um, experience that, that Isaiah has, and it's part of his commissioning to be a prophet and to, and to do various things for God. And as we look at that, you know, you see how the, the host of heaven are referring to the holiness of God. And so as we, we look at this as yet another verse that speaks to God's holiness, when we pray for the, the, the next couple, a minute and a half, we praise God for his perfect holiness. We offer thanks that there is perfect correspondence between God's nature and what he does, his actions. And this second to last one, confess your lack of reverence. And when I think about that, it's sometimes we, you know, and, and maybe people, maybe it's our culture, I don't know, and how we view things like as egalitarian. Like God is our buddy, he's our friend, I have a relationship. You know, and that takes him from here and brings him down as a, almost a peer. And sometimes I feel like that's just, well, I think that is disrespectful of who God is. You know, we need to be falling on our knees and in, in, in respecting his holiness. So, and so I, the confess that when we lack the reverence of God's holiness and then ask God uh, to reveal his holiness to you, to us more clearly. Okay, let's a uh, minute and a half. I'll set my timer. Go. last uh, little bit on this then is additional scripture that flesh out the, um, the promises associated with this name of God, the Holy One of Israel. And I'll just read these to you, but uh, here's the citation. Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on, it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And, uh, you know, it's interesting in the, in the book that I was reading to get ready for class, the author was talking about what's easier to, to write in, you know, Ten Commandments in stone or the hearts of people. <laughs> and sometimes the hearts of people may be harder than stone is, uh, is one of the things that, that she offered up. But uh, God is going to write who he is uh, his law on our hearts, and that will make us more like him. Hebrews ten fourteen through 16. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy, which makes it sound like it's a process, right? The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then John 3, 16, which we're very familiar with. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Hallelujah for that. Okay, let's uh, get to our second term for God today, and this is Yahweh Shalom. And I think you've probably all heard of the word Shalom. Uh, but if you take a minute, we flip over to Judges 6.24. This is this interaction of God with Gideon, and we'll read some more about that uh, and give you more enlightenment in a minute. But um, it says, So Gideon built an altar to the Lord uh, there, and he called it, The Lord is Peace. And if you've ever, you know, I'm trying to think how I encountered Shalom. It was probably in a movie or something like that. I've never been to Israel, but uh, Shalom is a Hebrew word. And, it, and we use it to mean peace, but it means so much more than peace, is my understanding. It, it, it includes the absence of outward, uh, not conflict, but conflict, uh, or a state of inner calm. But it goes further to mean wholeness, completeness, finished word, perfection, safety, or wellness. And uh, in the text, this word, you know, Yahweh Shalom is... Uh, living in harmony with God. Oh, don't we want that? Don't we want to be congruous with God's will in our lives? Uh, Don't we want to be back to the garden in that kind of relationship? And the fruit of this harmony, of this relationship with God, uh, is harmony uh, with others, uh, prosperity, health, satisfaction, soundness, wholeness, and well-being. And it's kind of like Nancy was saying a minute ago, or Pam, the whole idea of of a, a just God or a God that's proactive and caring for us, he's got a reason for us. He, he wants our lives to be a, a reflection of who he is, and he wants our lives to be so that it points to him and what he has done. So let's go and read a little bit more out of Judges um, chapter 6. And uh, again, I, I, I'm going to skip around a little bit. So it's verses 1 and 2, then 11 through 15. Uh, you can read the the details that uh, I left out later, but you'll get the the gist of what uh, this is about. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abersarite, right? Um, And his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the land, uh, into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength. You have, and uh, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, replied Gideon. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And continuing on the, the next slide. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from... Uh, an epaph of flour he made bread without yeast putting the meat in the basket and its broth in the pot he brought them out and offered them uh, under the yoke the angel of the lord said to him take the meat and the unleavened bread place them on this rock and pour out the broth and gideon did so the angel of the lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of his staff in his hand fire flared from the rock consuming the meat and the bread and the angel of the lord disappeared when gideon realized it was an angel of the lord he exclaimed Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. Now, that's an interesting conclusion to come to. 
But I think he comes to that conclusion because God may, has made a promise to him, and the promise is that you're going to be able to overrun these Midianites, and there'll be none left. And that hasn't even happened yet, and there won't be a lot of peace until that happens. But he, puts the, he makes this um, altar and declares that the Lord is peace. And so, uh, which is an interesting, again, uh, as, as Gideon, you know, he's in this situation. They're hiding in caves in these other places. And, you know, if God is with us, why are we in such bad shape? And, I, you know, on the one hand, you wish God would have said, you're here because you guys disobeyed me again. You know, my parents would remind me why I'm sitting in the dunce chair, you know? And uh, you were a dunce. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, you know, God goes on, and he's got a plan in mind, and we, we all know how it turns out. Getting with 300 men defeats this whole, this whole uh, Midianite operation. Alan? I, I, I agree that all of that's going to happen, and, and that peace was brought about. But I think the peace, I am thinking perhaps the peace that we're referring to in the name comes from uh, when he was scared for having a teen angel. God says, peace. And we'll call this place oh, okay. the Lord is peace. Okay, because uh, Alan thinks that the reason that the peace is not necessarily the peace that's going to come, but it's the peace from being in the presence of Almighty God and commemorated uh, with an altar because of the experience that uh, and the interaction with the angel and the um, uh, the proof through the consuming of the offering is is verification, and so that gives uh, Gideon peace. So, Okay, I trust God. It's going to happen, perhaps. All right, good. All right, let's go to this next uh, slide. And it, it has a few questions. You know, um, let me get to the right time here. What does this passage reveal about the way God deals with people's unfaithfulness? And I'll kind of jump ahead here. Uh, it's been said that there are consequences to unfaithfulness and to sin. And sometimes they're immediate. Sometimes they're delayed. Sometimes it happens to the, um, our actions affect others. And uh, so this is an example of, you know, God finally saying, how are they going to learn this lesson? They need to be uh, taught it by the Midianites. Okay? You know, we can think about uh, our, in our own lives when we've been, you might say, harassed by circumstances. You know, what caused the, the, these difficulties and how did, how did you respond to them? Uh, you know, again, that's just one of those things that I'd like you to think about. So why do you think the angel called Gideon a mighty warrior? Wasn't. <laughs> Alan says he called him that because he wasn't. But... Uh, God refers to Gideon, or the angel in this case, this is what my plan is for you. You know, your plan for your grandchildren is sweet boys. Um, I just think that's good. Sometimes we just have to have that and hear it over and over again, the imagery that, uh, you know, this is what God wants us to be. He wants us to be holy. Let's hear it again. We, he wants us to um, do various things. Conquerors. conquerors. You know, what it means to be more than a conqueror. Conquering sin and the, the things that are in our lives that are harassing us. That's, that's good stuff. Okay. Um, are you going to add something? No, you moved. No moving in my class. <laughs> okay, we do need to move on. We're getting close to the end here. Um, okay, so um, think about what we just read and let's take, a, we'll only do a minute this time because we're running out of time. 
uh, to praise God for his power to deliver us and give us peace, and I would call it his peace on his terms. Offer thanks for the things that happen to us that bring us back to God. Sometimes these things, you know, they are experiences. I, I mean, I, I, you think about Paul, Saul, and all the things he did. Have you ever felt like that? Do you ever feel like you've persecuted God or the church and your behavior and things you've done and how God brings you back? And, and you reflect on those things and say, you know, I'm not going there again. You know, I wanna, I'm going to stay faithful. Um, confess any patterns or behaviors in your life that, that keep you from experiencing God's peace. And I would call those things that steal your peace. You know, uh, I've said it lots of times that many of life's wounds are self-inflicted and uh, by decisions and things we do. And, you know, we do have an enemy out there that's, that's trying to ruin us, and uh, we need to be aware of that. And finally, ask God to free you from, uh, you know, oppression of any kind, but spiritual oppression. All right, one minute, then we'll wrap up. Let's, uh, four verses I'd like to read real quickly and we'll wrap. And these are just, again, these promises that come uh, from Scripture about uh, the Lord and His peace. Galatians 5, and 23, these are familiar with you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Proverbs 3, 13-17. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honor. Her uh, ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace, those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, 14, 14a. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me, and you will seek me with all your heart. I will be found uh, by you, declares the Lord. I want to... Um, just, we'll, we'll bounce past that slide uh, and this slide. And next week, uh, Thomas Wood will be teaching, and uh, it'll continue to be uh, more about the, the names of God. And then Wednesday evening, uh, we have this uh, whole, Holy Holistic Health. I hope you're participating in that. It's been really interesting and good, benefit.